I gotta go there tonight and teach my students. That keeps you grounded. What is up, everybody? Welcome. You're tuned in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 508, with today's guest, Sensei Daryl Vidal. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host of the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we're doing is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's the place to learn about everything we're doing. It's our online home. It's also the place to find our store. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you're going to save 15% off anything you find over there. Now, this show, Martial Arts Radio, has its very own website, and it is so creatively named WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. We like to keep it easy. Now, the show comes out twice a week with the goal being to educate, connect, entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help the show, if you want to help us with what we're working on at Whistlekick, there are quite a few ways you can do that. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media, tell a friend, pick up a book or a program leave a review, or support us on Patreon. If you think the new shows we're releasing are worth a whopping 63 cents a piece, not to mention all the back episodes you get access to, consider supporting us for just $5 a month. Visit patreon.com slash whistlekick and sign up there. If you do, we're going to give you even more stuff. We're committed to delivering more value than you think you deserve. We give away this show for free and all the other things, so much of what we do for free. And if you're willing to say, hey, I'll throw a couple bucks a month at you, we're going to give you even more because that's just how we do it here. Now, there's a chance that you know today's guest by name. And if you do, it means that you're probably a fan of a particular piece of martial arts history. Now, I'm not going to spoil that, but when we start talking about it, and it happens pretty early on in the conversation, you're going to go, really? Regardless of that, we have a great conversation. Quite often we have people on the show who have ties to a piece of, again, martial arts history. And the conversation becomes about that. Well, that's not what today was. Today we talked about Sensei Vidal and what he's done, where he's been, what he's hoping to do. It is, as far as I'm concerned, the best of both worlds. We've got celebrity and down to earth all wrapped up in one conversation. So here we go. Sensei Vidal, welcome to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. You know, looking, been looking forward to this one. You, you came as a referral, and we're not going to name drop yet because I know it'll happen later on. You came as a referral from a past guest, someone that I had an absolute blast talking to, and we're kind of making the rounds in this, in this particular piece of, let's call it cinematic history, okay. and, uh, hoping to hone in on, on one certain person who seems to keep dodging all of, all of our inquiries. So oh, really? if we can stack up enough people, yeah, maybe maybe they'll pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll people will be able know. to figure that out eventually. Well, yeah, yeah. They're, they're wondering now. We have them hooked, and that's the idea. Yeah, it was a good teaser. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Now, of course, it's a martial arts show. Everything we talk about stems from involvement in martial arts. So let's let's lay the foundation, if you will. And I'm going to ask okay. you the most, hopefully, the most boring question that I ask you today. How did you get started in martial arts? That's uh, that's a question. So I wasn't as young as you. I wasn't four. I, I, I grew up in uh, in Mira Mesa, California, San Diego, and my dad was in the Navy. And so there were a pretty big Filipino community there in, in San Diego and in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, so my parents used to go to a, um, they used to call him a faith healer. Uh, but he was an, an elder uh, Filipino gentleman who would, you know, make potions and do massages and do things that, that really help people with their ailments. Uh, but he also uh, did some uh, eskrima, Filipino stick fighting. So that was my earliest exposure to martial arts was to see them practice and hear the clack of the sticks and, you know, hold the sticks and do a little myself. But it wasn't until... Um, my brother, my older brother, started training uh, with in karate. Uh, that we started to to really learn karate style moves, and that was probably ten or twelve at that time, still in San Diego. And you know, then all the kung fu movies started coming out. And early seventies, we moved to Chino, California, which is still in Southern California, uh, but a much different neighborhood, a mostly white and Latino neighborhoods. 
Uh, and uh, so I wanted to keep that interest going. So we started taking karate from my current instructor who was teaching, you know, through the Chino Parks and Rec at the time, Joe Rosas. Um, and uh, we started training karate and that really just took off for me. It was, you know, I had an affinity to it. I had good natural skill. Uh, by the time I was getting to 16, 17 year, years old, I was, you know, getting to my brown and black belt levels, uh, competing in a lot of tournaments, uh, and then, you know, become being a big fan of Bruce Lee, I started to branch out into, you know, wrestling in high school and boxing, uh, and then and even to do some Wing Chun, and to always I've always continued my stick fighting. Uh, study with different people uh you know even through uh today so that's kind of like how it all got started i got my black belt when i was uh 18 with joe rosas in uh, 1991. that's quite the diverse I, I guess we'll say starting point and it sounds like you were doing some cross training earlier than i mean both in in age and in history than most people was was it really bruce lee's influence that inspired you to do that oh absolutely absolutely uh you know in having the Tao of jeet kune do as as a book that often referred to uh and, and really his his idea of J, jkd which to me is the precursor of you know mma uh his, his mixture of boxing and wing chun uh were were the specific reasons that I sought out to box and, and and find somebody to train in Wing Chun, and and it did change you know my whole outlook on martial arts. Even though I still love Kempo Karate, I still teach it the traditional way I learned it. Uh, I've, you know, I may have over the past forty years uh, adapted things and uh, you know uh, internalized things, if you will. It's still a very recognizable Kempo that my instructor still, uh, you know, is proud to say it's, it's his style of karate. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, boxing changed my karate. I don't think anybody who's experienced it would, would, uh, would feel differently. And, and even my, in my own home gym, my, all my equipment is boxing equipment because I mean, that's what you use for karate. You just need open space, you know. So, uh, but I still use those those exercise and training methods along with the karate. Uh, yeah. So, and then with Wing Chun, I you know I studied with this one person here and then another person there, uh, and so I have a traditional Wing Chun dummy in my in my gym and I use that training method as well. So yeah, I, it, it was that, but the, the, I think the more important thing, uh, less than the fact that that's what Bruce Lee did was that it, they're all great systems that have something to offer, uh, and, and mixing them together, uh, is, you know, is very, uh, rewarding and, uh, you know, practical even to some extent, and <clears throat> maybe impractical to another extent. But uh, it is it is definitely part of of my whole karate makeup, if you will. We've, as you might imagine, talked to quite a number of martial artists on this show. Yes. Who, and most of them, I'd say, have done some cross training. Most mm-hmm. of them, whether they started in one thing and ended up in something else, or maybe training. In things simultaneously, the the culture in martial arts has certainly shifted. We're we're certainly a lot more open to that cross training. That you know, Bruce Lee kind of I don't know if you predicted it, but certainly encouraged it. Mm-hmm. But you're talking about adding in boxing, which is something that we don't have a lot of people doing. Boxing, as a I guess we'll call it a system, tends to come into martial art, and I actually I consider boxing uh as a it can be a traditional martial art depending on how it's approached and and everything it doesn't have to be but it can be not everyone does but most of the time when we're speaking from a traditional perspective boxing comes in via kickboxing Mm -hmm. yeah yeah but your boxing's boxing's coming for you is coming in without the kickboxing it's coming in in the you know the 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 way we might see on on tv you know floyd mayweather etc Yes, yes. For those yes. of us who haven't 
approached boxing as a standalone pursuit, you said boxing really changed everything for you. And I, I'm, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. Sure. That's a great question. Uh, that's very astute, by the way. Uh, so just as a, for instance, uh, when you're, you're doing a karate stance and you're doing a karate punch, uh, you tend to be very firm in your stance uh, and, uh, you know, keep the, uh, the rear foot planted, heel down, uh, and, and, and uh, creating power through your foundation, right? Uh, and and if you're moving, then you're you're you're, you're moving forward as as a a, a structure, if you will, uh, that has this exploding punch coming off of it, uh, <clears throat> and the structure is what creates you know the power or the lack of collapse, if you will. Uh, in boxing, it's a little different because. Uh, you're 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 a lot more mobile. Okay, so you're using this much higher stance, uh, heel off the ground, off the, off the rear foot, uh, and when when you throw your right cross, basically the first punch you're, you're really learning outside of your jab is you're you're accelerating your body forward off the ball of your foot. Your heel is probably going to come off the ground. Your whole body might be shifting forward depending on your range. Uh, and and you're you're throwing you know the punch through the target line, and then popping it back here into my cover. It's 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 a fundamentally different move, uh, and I I'm not I'm not necessarily saying that uh, you know you can punch harder with one way or the other. Probably uh, you know similar amount of power based on you know your body makeup and your your weight and all that kind of stuff. But um, it just just the fluidity of of the boxing motion and, and uh, the uh, use of, of the twisting and torquing of the upper body uh, is is different. Uh, you know, the hook punch, uh, Bruce, one of Bruce Lee's favorite punch is a boxing punch, not a martial arts punch. Um, so that's that's kind of how um, how I see it. And it, it was right about what you said about kickboxing because uh, what I – uh, pursued boxing there was an intent to get into kickboxing because you know i'm a karate guy so let's do kickboxing so i, I went after the boxing but i never did get into a, a kickboxing uh gym or, or training because uh it, it's it tended to take on kind of um uh its own its own thing, right? Uh, there was, there were, there were great kickboxers. I mean, you mentioned Bill Wallace, who's you know probably one of the most uh, accomplished, and then obviously like Don the Dragon Wilson. Those were guys who were great kickboxers. But in the general community, when you went out, you couldn't go to a kickboxing gym. The people that were doing kickboxing were, you know, the the health spa gyms and they were doing this fake kickboxing where they wouldn't get in the ring. And it's like, that's not kickboxing. That's, that's, that's aerobics. Uh, aerobics. Exactly. <laughs> that's aerobics. So, uh, so I never did have the opportunity to really get in the ring and, and use my boxing along with my kicks, even though that was an idea at, at a certain time. Uh, so yeah, that's how the whole boxing fits in. But it is interesting what you said that, you know, it's not a traditional, martial art per se uh you know you might lump it in with even with wrestling uh so but but wrestling was something that i did in high school too uh <clears throat> so i think they all added you know something to my my martial arts you know compilation did you end up competing in which i guess in anything you know it, it's it sounds like you know, there were there was a point in time you're reading. I, I can imagine you as a teenager reading the Tao Jeet Kune Do and saying, "Okay, here are the pieces to this puzzle, and if I can assemble these and I can achieve some competency or even mastery of these requisite parts, I will. I'll have something really substantial here." Sure. And, so, so yeah, just to answer your question, they uh, yeah, from 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 uh, thirteen starting karate. So from about purple belt through. 21 of the karate kid time frame i competed actively in la uh in, in open tournament karate so that's kata and kumite type you know point sparring. 
So I did that actively uh, for several years, uh, accumulated so many trophies that I just had to start throwing them away. Uh, but um, the it, but that's where the boxing came in because uh, right as I was kind of in that lull, you know, I got my brown belt. Uh, I'm still waiting to where I might touch for my black belt. I'm still competing, but you know, I've been in the divisions for you know four or five years. Uh, starting to look around at other things, and that's when I picked up the boxing. And and I I mentioned it changed my martial arts. I after you box and throw right crosses and hit people in the face, point system goes kind of out the window because you lose that that kiss contact. And so I, you know, started getting disqualified more in, in the sparring competition uh, and just, you know, using excessive contact to the face because of the, the boxing, you know, the pet of follow through that you're using. So that's when I started to really less compete less. Uh, that's when the karate kid happened, you know, come, becoming older into an adulthood and getting married and all those type of things. So, uh, yeah. So I did a lot of competition. I boxed for two years uh, and had, you know, what, three amateur fights. So that was kind of the extent of it. Now you brought it up. I mean, you, you brought up Karate Kid, so we, we can't oh, just sorry. gloss over that. <laughs> we got we got to go there because it's such an important thing. And, and uh, you know, let's be real, part of the reason that we wanted to have you on the show was to talk about sure. it. Sure. How did it happen? Did they find you or did you try out or how'd it go? Okay, so um, just as to background to that story, I told you that I was into Bruce Lee and all that stuff. And, you know, I felt my skills were strong enough. Uh, so I did think that I would become, you know, some Hollywood karate movie star. I thought it could happen for me. Um, but I didn't know how to go about it. Uh, so um, through, so this is now it's 1983. Uh, I'm already a black belt uh, and competing in a tournament in, in Los Angeles. Uh, I had won the Kata division. He was getting ready to, to get in, in, into the sparring. And the director excuse me, of, uh, of Rocky at the time, John Albinson, directed the Rocky movies. He came up to me with his uh, assistant and said, hey, how'd you like to be in a movie? <laughs> so, pow, there it was. So, you know, it actually happened to me. Uh, and, of course, I said, absolutely, you know, I'm your guy. Uh, and uh, from there, it was, you know, the rest is history, as they say. I, I called the phone number, showed up in Burbank, went to soundstage, start rehearsing with all these, these actors that I don't know. Uh, teaching, you know, not, not me, but work training with them so they could learn karate. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's how it all got started. Most of us are never going to get the chance to work on a movie. It, it, for listeners, they might start to feel a little bit left out because we've had so many people who've been involved in TV and film on this show. But for those of us who, myself included, have never and likely never will be involved in a project like this. What's it like? Um, just before I answer that, I will tell you that when you live in Southern California, everyone has been involved in something. <laughs> so, so we just everyone... have to move. So that's the secret. If, if you want to be in, in uh, movies, move to SoCal. Well, I mean, I, maybe that's a, that's a gross <laughs> misstatement, but uh, I, I mean... In, in my community, I live in Marietta, which is a couple hours outside of L.A. Uh, and, you know, I know so many people who they go to auditions, they're great singers, they're talented, they dance, they do this, they do that. They've been in this. He's in this commercial. She's in that show. So, and, you know, because of the circle that I I have friends in, I, I everybody's got their, their projects that they're working on. But, okay, step back from that. Uh, I do recognize that um, if you're not, you know, uh, in Southern California and haven't been, you know, looking for it, uh, most people haven't been in the movies. So uh, typically I don't talk about the Karate Kid at all. I mean, almost never around my group of, you know, work and even my karate students. But when I have, when I do see somebody or get acquainted with somebody from a Maine, for instance, you know, somewhere that isn't, uh, uh, like the Hollywood type place, 
I, I, I might bring it up and, and talk about it. So your, your question, what is it like? Um, I was 20 years old, uh, pretty full of myself at the time, but, you know, still uh, naive, uh, you know, inexperienced kid uh, thrust into these actors and actresses and directors and, and the, and the, the Hollywood scene. I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. It's, uh, you know, a dream come true, if you will. Um, it's not all it's cut out to be, you know, all those stories that you hear of people that, you know, they wait tables so that they can try to get their big break. It's true. Uh, those are the, also the people that I've met, uh, you know, in and around the movie sets uh, and, the, and the, the rehearsal stages, you know. So it, it is, it's, it, 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 it's what you see on television. Uh, and when they show, uh, you know, kind of like the reality uh, situation uh, you see that too uh, but I did get to to uh, participate in it through the whole Karate Kid and the release of the movie and and the opening at, at uh, wherever it was I don't remember if it was Chuck Grumman's I think it was somewhere else director skill maybe and and so I did get through all that uh, but then not being an actor with an agent uh, it kind of all fizzled after that um, I think I had one other audition that I ha had the opportunity to go to. And after that, I just kind of started working full time and got married and continued taking up my, you know, doing my martial arts. Uh, and, and that was it for the most part. So you don't sound regretful. Uh, I don't, I, I don't. I mean, it, it, the, the livelihood that they live, I mean, if you made it big, great. Uh, I mean, Ralph, obviously, uh, made a ton uh and he's he's great he's, when i see him he's still a great guy he, you know talks to me like i'm his, his old pal uh so yeah i i mean i i, I just don't know what it would have been like uh and I'm, I'm very happy with the life i lead now i you know i have four kids that are all growing up and a couple of grandkids and i'm still teaching and training uh my wife is a dance instructor she does what she does and you know, we've been married for 30 plus years. So yeah, I, I, I don't have a lot of regrets. I can't say I have none, but uh, you know, that whole Hollywood thing is not all it's cut out to be. But then again, you know, if, if I'd have made a, a giant bundle of dough, maybe I'd say something different. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know too many people who have said, you know, I regret making all that money. I'm sure somebody somewhere has said that, but it's not something I'm used to hearing. Maybe because I'm not hanging around people making bundles of money. No, but we could, you know, how many stories have we heard of kids that, I mean, it just doesn't work out great for them, you know? So the, right. those are all real stories and they're real people. And, and so that's the part of it that, you know, I don't have any regrets about not getting, you know, caught up in. So I don't know. I don't know if that's a good answer. No, I think it's a great answer. It makes makes a lot of sense. You worked with what you had. Right? Exactly. And you moved on, yeah. and and I'd like to know how how you ended up teaching. It sounds like it, running your school is is your primary job. No, it's my okay. it's my secondary job. Okay. I have a regular job as a, a, a technology uh, IT type consultant is what I do. Yeah, uh, uh, another martial artist who's into IT. There, there have been many. There's something yes. there. There's something about those the personality types. Uh, I'd like to. I, I, I'm curious. I mean, I know some, but uh, I, it, to me, it's not an overwhelming um, uh, uh, factor. But you know, who knows? You you may know better than I do. They're, they're just they're seen, and and I have no data to back this up. But just anecdotally, there seems to be sure. Uh, a broader Venn diagram intersection of martial arts and tech. I, I think it might be figuring things out. You know, those Maybe. of us who stick around in martial arts like to figure things you, you out. Know what? You may be onto something because I think uh, what people like about my teaching of of karate and of stick fighting is is my an analytical, you know, and mechanical viewpoint. Uh, uh, how I I don't just say do this, do that, but, you know, I can give you some functional anatomical 
uh, even philosophical back, background to, to, to the way of things. Uh, and, and so if you don't mind going off the tangent, my, my regular sure. job is yeah, I, please. I'm a consultant for educational technology systems for almost well, 25 years or so. Uh, and, and I've actually published seven books on ed tech and project oh, management wow. and distance learning and stuff like that. So it is an active part of my, my uh, main career. Uh, but uh, my karate, I, I've been living in Marietta here for 30 years and I started my own parks and rec program. As you can remember, I said my instructor was at Chino Parks and Rec. And, and so I, I kind of just took that model and, and came to Marietta uh, as a young family man and, and started teaching through our parks and rec and here we are 30 years later I'm still teaching online to, tonight but um, yeah I still have the parks and rec program and I, it's a great way to stay in touch with your martial arts without you know relying on it to be my you know my whole right whip, and, and that, that's such an important important thing I think given what's going on right now, people are starting to see the value in at least some diversification in, in how you, you live and you, you make your money. I think it's important. Something that I try to do as well. Yeah. The stories that we've heard from you so far today have all been really positive, really uplifting, uh, warm, fuzzy, if you will. But I, I would be surprised if that was the entirety of your life. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take a stab in the dark because this is a statistically a pretty good stab that I can take when I talk to someone. In that, at some point along the way, something went wrong. Something wasn't good. Something sucked, and you were able to lean on your martial arts in a way, whether it be emotionally or physically, to move past that. Is there is there something from your past like that that you might tell us about? Boy, man. <laughs> that, you must have some statistics that, that prove that you can do that. Uh, but you, you just, really... Just hunches. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like I said, you, you must have done it enough time to know that you can. Uh, you know, you, you, you pull at some interesting uh, thought streams that uh, most people don't don't venture upon. Well, thank you. Uh, Appreciate it. it. It is. It, so I'm, I'm trying to relate to something that um, that truly was was overcome, if you will, through my training. Uh, and you know, in terms of hardships, family-wise, I've been great. You know, I have four wonderful kids. They they've all done well. I have. You know, grandkids, all that kind of stuff. So that's not an area where I think I've I've hit the major challenge. My marriage has been great. Uh, you know, I think career-wise and, and financially is, is where I've had some challenges. I've changed jobs recently, uh, even though I own my own business for, for 20 years um, before that. And and I've been an entrepreneur. I've started, start, started companies and had them fail and, and – and so I, those are probably been my biggest heartaches and challenges were, were things that I've, I've tried to do uh, to do better for the family and have may have blown up in my face. But, it, you know, it's funny that you talk about how martial arts um, has kept me, you know, has saved me or whatever if you, way you want to put it. But if it's nothing more simple and fundamental than the fact that I got to go there tonight and teach my students that keeps you grounded. You know, people talk about leaving their work at home. You know, I've had difficult times at work. I've, you know, had to, you know, get laid off even as a, a person, you know, 50 years old plus I didn't get laid off, but I was given a choice. And so I, I opted to, to step away. Uh, the things that always worked out, um, you know, I still work through some struggles, uh, but the, I, it, it really is as simple as, well, I, I have to deal with that, but I also have to go do teach karate. And when I'm teaching karate, you know, I don't worry about these things. I worry about my students and, 
I don't worry about them. You know, I, I'm helping them. I'm, I'm guiding them. Uh, they're teaching me. Uh, you know, we're all in this kind of thing together. That's, I think, is really the most fundamentally rewarding thing about teaching martial arts. Um, I have a saying that I've been quoted as, it really sums it up for me, is uh, we, uh, by, by, by demanding excellence, we help others achieve excellence. Hmm. So, you know, just by being there and saying that, you know, it's got to be done this way and holding to the standard, you know, people can achieve things that they never knew they could achieve before. Uh, and similarly in business, you know, if you were running a company and you're able to employ people, I used to love it when my employees would show up and they bought a new car because, you know, you basically were part of that. You help them achieve that. You help them buy that, uh, and and so that was always very rewarding for me. So uh, yeah, I think that there is a connection back there, and just the fact that you know you train every day, uh, well, not every day, but you know ongoing, uh, week by week, uh, with no end in sight. I think is what it is. Uh, and it's something that you're a lifestyle, a way that you live. Uh, and, and guiding others in that uh, that they're in their path to seek their their knowledge uh, is is the most rewarding. So yeah, good question. Thank you. I, I told you that first one. That first one. How did you get started? The goal is that that's the most boring, obvious question. Everything else stems from whatever you give me to work with. Kind of like uh, sparring, okay. right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There's a lot of corollaries here. You talked about educational technology and this consulting. So, you know, here we've got multiple aspects of your life where knowledge and sharing knowledge and, and anybody who's been a consultant knows that a consultant quite often is a teacher in and of that of itself. You know, you're, you're taking your experience and you're conveying and you're offering advice, et cetera. Exactly. Where did that, that desire, um, dare I even say, love for passing on what you've learned come from did that did that come from your parents did you have an, a really impactful teacher as a child well another very good question i i don't know that i got it i've never thought about whether it comes from someone uh but i, I i've always been even as a very young person very analytical um to the point where uh, you know i would could could be accused of overanalyzing things and being too analytical or, you know, analysis paralysis, if you will. Uh, but my, my mind is very system, systematic and functional. Uh, and I'm very good at just breaking things down into its components and defining those components. And that's why I'm, I'm such a, a good process person for IT because I can look at this and say, okay, this needs to happen, this needs to happen, and this needs to happen. And, I, and you know, I'm so far away from things like programming, per se, uh, and configuring a router, per se, or, uh, you know, designing a network or an IP map or something like that. I'm, I'm just at the 30,000-foot level. But there is so much value there because the typical, you know, technology person lives in tactical implementation and my mind takes me to strategic you know what's the big picture what are you trying to accomplish what's the objective uh, but then taking that high level strategy and then and then t turning it into implementation into ta uh, tactical plans uh, that's where I've, I've found my my um, talent uh, and I'm using it even today as we're dealing with, you know, the COVID situation in, in my current employee. Uh, but to answer your question, where did it come from? Um, I don't know that I could say it, this person uh, taught me that or that person. You know, obviously my instructor, Joe Rosas, was a, is a great conveyor of, of you know, the way of our, our karate. Uh, and I've had great teachers, but I can't say that any of them drew, you know, drew me toward um, any type of, you know, being a consultant. But I think that as I, as I 
develop my uh, more technical background in IT and you know networking, <clears throat> I, I, I found that I had a talent at taking something that's complex and being able to explain it to uh, non-technical types uh, and then even making persuasive arguments uh, you know based on you know whatever fundamentals uh, I can I can gather up and compile. And, and so what I'm good at is, is taking these concepts and writing them up into something that you can digest and you can use to persuade people and use to show, you know, to create step-by-step -step plans, if you will. So that's kind of uh, where, I, where I think that comes from. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I can't say that there's a person that I tie that to, but I, that, it's a good question. Thanks. I, I, don't, I don't think it's an unfortunate. It's, it, it is what it is, right? I mean, sometimes... Yeah, exactly. Sometimes the, the impetus for the things that we do is completely random. Sometimes we can track it back. Sometimes we need to spend, you know, a few weeks on a therapist's couch to figure out why we do. Right. And you might not do. even think about it until somebody asks you that yeah. question very specifically. <laughs> yeah. That's why I like asking those questions because some, sometimes they lead us in really interesting directions. Sometimes they don't. And both are yeah. completely fine because, you know, our conversation today, this is the story of you. This, this is you and, and your time through the martial arts now if for those of us listening if if we i'm assuming because you, you use the title sensei you call it a dojo if we yes. attended a class in your dojo you know given what you just talked about with the way that you present information would we see anything different in the way you teach versus maybe the way most martial arts schools are conducted is there a, is there a focus on certain things? Is there a way that you break concepts down? Do you bring in a chalkboard? No, you know that's those are great. That's great questions. I uh, I think the the difference would be in the level of you know analytical detail I might try to bring, mm. uh, but I don't always do it. Uh, I, I think I think muscle memory and. Uh, uh, repetition are just as important uh, and you know visual kinesthetic you know contact where you're look at me how I'm doing this look at how it should work with you uh, anatomical you know this is how the body is developed uh, this is how our joints go together this is how the bones align uh, you know I try to present all those things to to show you know why we, we move a certain way we do and maybe even to explain why you do a certain thing because of a traditional, you know, legacy thing or, you know, something that they've always done type of thing. And you want to validate that somehow. Um, I think that, I don't know that it, that's different because I haven't attended enough other people's classes to see, you know, how analytical that they, they might be. But I can say that uh, well, about 10 years ago, when I first started teaching karate here in Marietta, uh, I started them at seven <clears throat> because to me, uh, that's what my instructor did. And at seven, I think that you have you start to, you know, know your body a little bit better uh, than, for instance, four. You know, which you know you had mentioned that you had started. But I was my they kept telling me, you know, you would have twice as many students if you had if you would take four year olds. So about ten years ago, I started. Okay, I'll tell you, I'll do junior karate. Uh, four to six year olds, half hour once a week, and those classes filled up. Uh, and so I did. I doubled my students. I got all these little crazy monkeys running around. Uh, I'm really, really good at getting them in line. In fact, I would say that that parents just their jaws drop when their four year old comes into my class and they stand straight in line, in position, waiting for class to start without running around, without falling off the, you know, the tables, and even though that's what they were doing five minutes before. Uh, and, and the reason I think that I'm good at that is because, one, uh, I'm, just, I'm just mean enough you know, to, be, to be that sensei. Uh, but I'm not unfair. And I'm not unreasonable. Obviously, if you need to go to the bathroom, you go to the bathroom. And, uh, if you did something funny, I laugh at it. Uh, but I also... Um, I also respect their intellect at the age of four, and I try to explain things very clearly. Uh, but what you'll find is there's a, a broad range of 
you know, capability at four to six, where some kids get it, some kids don't. So if I explain something very explicitly, even taking more time than you might think necessary, some kids will get it and you'll see it reflect in their, their position. You know, they get it. They, they understood what I was. So I've always really been rewarded to find those kids who I can explain something like you might explain to a, a teenager and the, and the little kid gets it. But then the other kids see them get it. Uh, and then it just follows in this kind of peer pressure or peer, uh, whatever, uh, imitation, uh, where they, they start to fall in line together. Of course, you're always going to get the crazy kid who you can't get straight and that's fine. I'll, I'll keep them over the side and let their mother rescue me from them at a certain point. But, uh, for the most part, you know, I can get these four to six year olds to line up, straighten their line, keep their eyes forward, focus on their target you know, and, and do some of this fundamental karate. Uh, so, I, I, shoot, I, I think I might've forgot what your question was. But. That's okay. That's okay. I, like, like I told you, and, and listeners, you guys don't get to hear the kind of the pre-show chat that I give most of the guests, but I tell them, go, feel free to wander, go get out into the weeds. The questions don't matter. You know, there's no, this isn't a, this isn't a test. This isn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not Larry King. My, my questions are more just talking points, you know, just to keep yeah. you, keep you going. Yeah, and that's it, what you it, did. Yeah. And you brought me to a place that, uh, with the junior karate that I think I've rationalized my, my position where, Oh, and I think one of the points I wanted to make was yeah. a lot of kids that start at four quit at four two and <laughs> never come back. So, I, you know, that's why I think that the seven, you know, if I get them at seven and get them to train, get them to get to be a, become a teenager, I'll probably have a good chance of, you know, keeping them for life. Uh, not that you won't have that chance, but, and, and not that it's a bad thing. I just think like, uh, maybe it's a selfish thing, uh, but um, I, I'm definitely uh, not opposed to it at this point. Anyone who's taught martial arts to four-year-olds, five-year-olds, even six and seven-year-olds, knows that it's a challenge to get them to understand martial arts for what it is. They don't have the life experience. They don't have the context. They don't walk. They, they've never, you can bring up self-defense, but they've probably never been afraid of someone taking their wallet or, or <laughs> harming them. You know, so how do you, how do you relate to them? And it sounds like you're engaging with them on their level. You're meeting their energy, which I don't consider myself good teaching children. I, I know plenty of people we've had a number of guests on this show who are infinitely better working with young kids than I am. But the one thing yeah. I try to do that I figure if nothing else is to meet them where they're at. If they're, if, if the whole class is being silly that day, I'm not going to try and make them serious. I'll be silly with them and find a way to make what we're doing silly and try to get and something that, out of them. Yeah. And you know what? That's a good point because sometimes they, they'll be silly and I'll say something like, there's no laughing in karate. You know, of course, that just gets them to laugh more. And, you know, and I get into that with them. So uh, you're right. You're right about that. My, my fundamental teaching philosophy is if people aren't having fun, they're not going to learn. Yes. Agreed. Now, you mentioned earlier that you've written, I, th I think you said seven books. Yes. None of them on martial arts. <laughs> okay, so just to, to clarify, yeah, I've written seven books on education technology. Okay. Uh, I've written two other books. Oh, uh, one of them is a novel, an IT novel, uh, which is the first book I ever wrote. That, uh, forgive and, me, uh, and 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 I, I I preface this with, I had an IT consultancy for for close to twenty years, so okay. I'm going to throw myself under the bus with you. IT novel sounds like one of the nerdiest things I've ever heard. Oh man, you would it is super nerdy. And it was written, <laughs> it was written pre to Y2K. Oh so oh. so you would I have you chills. Would, yeah, you would read it and throw up because it's just <laughs> so nerdy. Um, but it, it's a classic. It's a novel about a, a you know a network engineer who obviously has access to 
you know, companies back end information. So he gets laid off and gets into trouble and starts accessing and stealing money and mm. stealing money from the wrong people and blah, 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 and on and on. And, you know, but it's, it, it's a fun little story and uh, I'm glad I wrote it. It's, it's up on Amazon. Uh, we'll have to make sure not, we, I don't think you, you gave us links for that stuff in the, when you said in the form, uh, we got to make sure we link that up. People will be interested. Yeah, I mean, you could just type in my name on Amazon. All my books will come up. So uh, that's it. But the other one that I wrote more, more recently uh, is a memoir of uh, a musician. Uh, his name is Marty, and he played trombone behind Elvis and Frank Sinatra. Mm. So here's this is way off you know, yeah. off center for yeah, everything that, else that intriguing. I've done. Yeah, but it is a, it's a great story. Uh, and I actually have an independent producer, you know, trying to turn it into a movie. So maybe maybe that'll happen. But yeah, those are the books that I've written. And bef- before we move move on from that, this this gentleman the me- memoir is about, you you know him? You met him? Yes, yes. How did, yes. How did that happen? I mean, that, I would assume a trombonist at, at that level is pretty darn impressive not somebody you bump into every day oh no it's a great story in fact he's an older gentleman in the mid 80s or so uh we met uh in a golf tournament i got i got paired up with him in a charity golf tournament and he starts talking about elvis and frank sinatra and you know dean martin and frank sammy davis and i'm just like this guy is something else he's you know I can't believe it. So I, I, I spent the whole day, you know, jogging his memory and, and, uh, and I said, Marty, you know, you got to write a book about all this stuff. And he says, yeah, everybody tells me that, but da, 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 this and that. So by the end of the dinner, I told him, Marty, I'm an author. I write different kinds of stuff, but I want to write your life story. And so we met uh, once a week on Wednesday nights at a restaurant here in Murrieta, where he lived out here too for a while, <clears throat> uh, for three months. And I did all the interviews, like you're interviewing me, uh, and we'd have dinner, and I compiled it and wrote this book. And I love the book. It's a very fascinating book. Uh, we, it's got stories that you know you might have heard maybe or probably not. Uh, about you know the Rat Pack, about uh, Liberace, and you know, like I said, Frank Sinatra. Uh, did you? I don't know. Do you know much about the that era of? I of I know a little bit. Um, you know, I, I had some some teachers in school who were really fond. Uh, one I'm thinking of in particular was was a big Sammy Davis Jr. fan. So we we would get some stories. Uh, yeah. You know, one of those teachers that you can you can poke a little bit and get off subject, and the whole the whole school uh, the whole class will go by, and, and you didn't actually do anything. So, uh, yeah. we, we we got some stories that way. But is that you know was was that a a era that you you felt it, really it, tied it, to? It was, uh, you know, in uh, in growing up in the sixties and seventies, uh, what was nostalgic at the time was Happy Days, right, the fifties. Uh, and so, uh, and then the tail end of, of Elvis. So as I was growing up, so probably in my late thirties and forties, uh, when, when music started to really take a downward turn, uh, I, I had a resurgence of going back and listening to, uh, a lot of the, you know, the Rat Pack era, Frank Sinatra, uh, you know, Tom Jones, uh, Elvis, obviously the Beatles. Uh, and you know I'm a uh, I'm a rock and roll type fan too, so you know Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin and all that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> yeah, um, that's where all that came from. And uh, you know it is I'm I'm a, uh, a an amateur musician. I play guitar and ukulele, and I used to play in a band. So there, I have a little bit of that in me mm. uh, to where I, I can keep it interesting for myself, if you want. Mm. There's uh for you we haven't talked much about what you talked about one of the things you talked about really early on in our conversation with the Filipino stick fighting but uh, I've I find the the footwork 
that I've been taught in stick fighting to be very rhythmic, very musical. It reminds me a lot of the the movement in capoeira, if you've ever had mm-hmm. the opportunity. Uh, well, so- well, Jeremy, I will tell you, Jeremy Lesniak, that you have hit a nail on the head uh, that very few um, understand. But I, I teach Filipino stick fighting, and I just call it that. I don't call it Eskrima, Cali, or Arnis because... I've learned from so many different people that I can't attribute it to one system. I have mm. assembled my own system and sense. I teach it here in Mariana as the Filipino martial arts. Um, but you can come on any night here. We talk about the footwork uh, because it is the key to, to it. It is rhythmic. Um, it is uh, fluid and dynamic and hard and soft and all those things. Uh, so yeah, yeah. The first time right. I saw taiko drumming, which was only a few years ago, it it could have been FMA. Sure. I don't know if you've had the chance to watch taiko, but anybody out there who's listening, who's spent time, you know, doing double stick in in any system and has seen taiko drumming, I mean, it. it that you could pull that drum off those people and they could beat the snot out of you with those sticks. <laughs> I do know what you're talking about. Yes. Cool. Cool. This, this is good stuff. This is fun. So we, we, we got here with a question about, you know, why no martial arts book? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask that question again. Sure. Sure. Uh, you know, you, yeah. you've done some interesting things. I, there, there has to have been at least some, some thought. You know, I, I, when, I, when I first thought about writing a book, okay, all right. See, now you've backed me up to a place I haven't been before. The first, <laughs> book, the first book I ever tried to write was a martial arts book, okay? Uh, and I just thought of that through you, okay, Jeremy? Because, uh, I, like I said, I had this analytical mind. I feel like I could put things down. So I started to put this down, and I started writing it. Uh, but I think I realized at the early stage that my my experience is limited to point fighting uh, and that point fighting doesn't extrapolate to anything in real life <laughs> except for winning and losing and stuff right sure. uh, and, and 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 as you expand that concept that is true for all martial arts in the respect that, Martial arts versus self-defense, you know, martial arts will only get you so far in self-defense, right? Let's just put it that way. I mean, I, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there's always rules, right? Whether it's MMA or Shotokan or Judo or boxing or wrestling, there's always rules. So nothing relates directly to self-defense. And it's, it's also a reason that uh, people – in martial arts gravitate to weaponry, uh, not guns and knives. So um, it's funny that um, this came out of a discussion about books. But uh, So yeah, one of the books that I wrote about education technology is, uh, is called Confucius in the Technology Era. Uh, and, and the concept between this is I, I used to study the Tao, the Tao Te Ching, the I Ching, and Confucius uh, to an extent in my younger college days and then more recently as well. So when I wrote this book, I I took the the philosophical approach to say everything about technology, uh, I'm going to look at it as if I was uh, Lao Tzu, you know, the Tao Taoism guy. Uh, So that is the extent of it, and it's really more about Chinese philosophy than it is about martial arts. So, yeah, to answer the question, no martial arts books yet. <laughs> well, well, I, I hope we get to underscore that word yet, because I, yet. I, I've got oh, a yeah. feeling, I've got a feeling there's, there's one, there's one in there. I think everybody has something to say. And most of us don't ever find the courage in the medium to express it. You know, yeah, whether that be that. music yeah. or, or writing a book or a play or, or whatever. Now, one question that I do try to ask Every guest who has participated in in the film industry, what's your favorite martial arts movie? Oh well, I mean that's easy one. Uh, Enter the Dragon. Okay. 
Yeah. Now, here's another uh, theory. Was that your okay. first Bruce Lee? Uh, no. Okay. Was, All right. You're, you're yeah. only the second. Okay. Tell. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I have this well, theory that everybody's I'll, first Bruce Lee movie becomes their favorite one. Okay. So, um, you know, I was growing up at the time. This is my, my early teens. Uh, 1973, 1972. So the first one that came out that I saw uh, was called Chinese Connection, yeah. but it's more and more known as Fist of Fury. So uh, that was the first one that I saw. And that was like Bruce, that blew my mind because everything before that was, you know, Shaolin Warrior, Five Fingers of Death. Uh, I can't even think of the crazy stuff where the guys were flying around and puff up like balloons and, you know, <laughs> spin around and do whatever's uh bruce lee brought you know brought what he brought to it uh and the, but but Dra enter the dragon was the second okay so return of the dragon or uh what was it called game uh game of death no. okay that was obviously after but yeah uh, chinese connection was called fist of fury mm -hmm. i think return of the dragon had another name like maybe that was called I don't know. Oh, but right. I, I yeah. didn't see that uh, until, the, but then I did see Enter the Dragon in the big screen, and that was it. I was going to be Bruce Lee. <laughs> so. You, you, and everyone else, man. There, exactly. there was just there was something about him, and and him being on screen, and you know we we've certainly, um, you know, heard heard from some folks, especially folks of of Asian descent, who said that you know for the first time seeing someone who wasn't white on the screen was so powerful for them. Sure, sure. And for me, like I said, I grew up in my younger years around a lot of Filipino community, uh, but uh, in my high school years, I was in a, a white and Latino community, so there were no Asians. So um, in that time. Everyone thought I looked like Bruce Lee because I was <laughs> Asian. So, so it, was, it was part of my growing up. Hey, there's Bruce Lee. Well, we, we've talked about a lot of different things today. We've gone a lot of different directions. And I think we've got a pretty good idea of, of where you've been and where you are. So now let's turn, turn the clock forward, if you will. What's coming? What are you, what are you working for, hoping for, goals? You know, and you can you can answer this kind of in whatever timeline you want. You know, but I ask us just to look towards the future and tell us what you're seeing and, and hoping to see. Sure. Um, again, another deep question because, I, like I said, I just changed jobs recently and I'm doing work directly with the school district, so I'm kind of immersed in that. Uh, but I'm looking this to kind of end my my full time career. Uh, probably work here for you know a few more years, and then uh, uh, what I'd like to do is return, uh, seek to uh, you know semi-retire into a consulting mode where I can still continue to you know offer my services in strategic planning to you know school districts. So I, I think I I, I want to see myself move into that, like I said, like a semi-retirement here in the next ten years. Uh, I don't see an end to my training, although my body <clears throat> is telling me differently, uh, but my, my mind certainly isn't. Uh, and, you know, I, I have some other pursuits. I, I snowboard in the wintertime. I love to fish. Uh, and I like to play golf. So those are all things I haven't been able to do much, especially recently. Uh, so tend to, to want to pursue those things. Uh, and uh, you know, continue to watch my family grow. I, I have two grandkids. My, my one of my daughters is is married and get, gonna have a baby here. So I'll have three, and definitely hope to see my other two kids get married and have kids, and, and someday have you know a giant litter of grandkids running around my house. <laughs> Are you gonna teach your martial arts? Uh, absolutely. If, if, if it works out, I mean, uh, you know, all my kids trained with me, both my boys got their black belts, uh, my daughters danced with my wife, so they didn't complete the, the, you know, the curriculum, but definitely if that's something that they want to do, I'll be here for them. 
Great. Now, if people want to find you, website, social media, anything like that, where would they go? Sure. Yeah. I'm very open on my Facebook, Vidal Kempo or Vidal Kempo. Uh, anybody can go. I'm going to get close to 5,000, so I'll probably have to start deleting people. Uh, but go ahead and try to add me there. I, I talk to anybody. Um, I'm a member of a lot of those Cobra Kai Karate Kid groups. <laughs> uh, and so I try to par- participate and, you know, be a good, uh, a, a good, um, how do you say, I don't want to say, I don't like to say celebrity because I don't really consider myself a celebrity, but a good people for the fans because the, the fans love it. And so I, I try to make myself uh, available and, and, uh, you know, approachable uh, and, and, you know, people like it. I've made some great, you know, social friendships that way so social great. media friendships are so, we yeah. going to see you in the new series uh well if you've watched the old series you already saw me i i, I made uh they took they took stuff from my from karate kid one and yes and it appeared in in the first season and then the second season they talked about me but uh they're you know not not in season three i can tell you that uh, no. So, but I am friends with, you know, the creators on Facebook and we've had, uh, you know, kind of sideline, disc- not sideline, but like discussions about this and that, not about me being in, in, in it. Uh, but there's a ton of that kind of discussion out there. So I, well, I, like I hope it happens because, you know, I, I consider myself the exact perfect person that the Cobra Kai series was, was created for. You know, I was born in 79, Karate Kid hit at the right time for me. I grew up with it. It, you know, objectively, I think we can all agree. There's nothing that should make it a great movie, but it is. I love that. <laughs> it is. It is a. It, it manages to capture something so special that defies the writing, the acting, the story. It's just, it's just great, and not in a a sarcastic way that you know, like people point at Evil Dead Two and say. You know, that that movie's great because it's ridiculous and silly. But Karate Kid is something really special. And so it came back and I watched the first season in in like 12 hours. And I did the same thing with season two, you know, just give me more because this, you know, these people have grown up in the same way that that I've grown up. And I, I hope they will reprise your role, even if it's even if it's a small one, because you were part of making something that was so special to so many people, including myself. Well, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. And, you know, maybe it'll happen. And now as we, as we walk off into this virtual sunset, I asked the guests, how do you, how do you want to end? You know, parting words, words of wisdom, you know, some encapsulation of advice, whatever it is, what would you want to leave the listeners with today? Well, you know, I, I use my, quote that I have already. Uh, and so I don't know that I have something else, but, uh, I, I, I will tell you that, you know, I, I appreciate your interview, your interview style. Uh, and you've taken me places where I haven't gone in interviews recently. So I very much appreciate that. So I, maybe that's a good way to finish off. I had a wonderful time with this episode. Great conversation with Sensei Vidal. And we had fun talking both before and after the episode. I am so blessed with what I get to do as work. I get to talk to these wonderful people. And here we have another example of a wonderful person going deep, being open. And I get to have a fantastic conversation in the process. And you get to hear it. So thank you, Sensei, for coming on. Thanks for all that you've done and all that you will do. If you want to see the show notes with links to the things that we've talked about, photos, a bunch more. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check it out, episode 508. And if you're up for supporting us and the work that we do, you have a few options. Make a purchase at whistlekick.com. And if you do, don't forget the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. You might also consider buying one of our Amazon books or our programs, telling others about the show, or supporting us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. You can do that for as little as $2 a month. If you see somebody out in the world wearing something with Whistlekick on it, please introduce yourself. One of my personal goals here with Whistlekick is that we use this community to break down barriers and show that we are all 
martial artists, and we start helping each other far more than we do. If you have guest suggestions, people that you think would be great to hear from, let me know. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And our social media is the place to find a lot of great educational and entertaining content. We're at Whistlekick everywhere you could shake a stick at. And I thank you for your support. Remember, without you listening, I would just be a crazy guy with a microphone. So thanks for giving me that opportunity. I do not take it for granted. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.